on this episode of Damsels in the DMs. I think that one thing that we should always consider is that this industry is very, very difficult, very hard. And it's just like, I feel like they, that directors are put in a line to end up in a finish line. And to be honest, it shouldn't be a competition. It should be, mm. everybody should go through the, their own process. This message is intended as a reminder that we are not licensed professionals, not psychiatrists or psychologists. If you have a serious problem, please seek professional help. The National Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. There's some damsels in the DM. Yes, queen. (laughs) Tell us what's the vibe. There's some damsels in the DM. Yeah. Please tell us what's the vibe. DMs, DMs, yeah we see them, yeah we read them. DMs, DMs, we don't need them, we just leave them. Please, yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. I'm Lauren. And I'm Alejandro. And Alejandro, you have a Disruptors Fellowship that I want to hear all about. Tell us what that means and what you've been working on. It's been a really cool process. I was invited um, because of the work that I was able to show on Undocumented exactly Tales uh, to be a part of Disruptors Fellowship. And it was a really great opportunity to connect with other passionate storytellers, directors, writers, producers. Oh my God, the energy was amazing. And so we had rehearsal and we had an in-person rehearsal tech as well and it all led to this final showcase uh, which was a really amazing lineup of stories it was like 10 minutes for each one but a great way to showcase different ideas for episodics that hopefully get legs so i'm so pumped thank you for asking how have you been of course yeah so i'm not sure if i mentioned on here but i booked the lead in a feature which i'm super excited about um i think i may have told you offline when we were talking but i don't think i said it on the episode so very excited about it it's an election movie coming out around election time my character i describe her as a brunette legally blonde um so she's super cool her name is anna summers and she decides to run for mayor in her town so I'm having a blast getting to know her. It's like my first time being a full lead in a feature I've been supporting before. So being on every page for 95 pages is something that, you know, was a huge task that I didn't realize. Like I've made poor Brian take on 10 pages with me every night. So it's a huge blessing that I'm super happy about, but definitely requiring me to put in some uh, marathon equivalent training into it. I feel like you have the stamina for that, though. That's so incredible. Thank you. Congratulations. That's so Thank exciting. you. Oh, Thank you so much. It's so nice to see these things paying off for us. So I'm very happy in today's episode for us. Same, same. And speaking of features and that nonstop work coming their way, Sofia Garza Barba is on with us today. I'm so happy about this. Oh, my God. I mean, can you imagine or can you even re- do you realize how quickly time has gone since we met her in New York? Well, yeah. So it's so crazy because Sophia, like me and Alejandro's film Defining Dodo won the um, LGBTQ Voices Award at the HBO sponsored official Latino festival, which is where we first met Sophia. And I've talked about it before on the podcast, but Alejandro to me is the absolute king of networking because he doesn't network. He just gives off the best energy, which just draws people to him. I have never met anyone who makes lifelong friends at festivals the way Alejandro does. So anyway, Alejandro became super close with her. And then when I was at the Bentonville Film Festival, Alejandro was like, oh my God, Sophia, who we met at Official Latino, also is there at Bentonville. So then I got to reconnect with her. I know you recently made a film with her, Pecadillo, correct? Yes, we made Pecadillo, and that was such an amazing experience of being able to shoot it in Monterrey and now being able to celebrate it at festivals. It's been incredible. It's been such a gift. And they, I mean, we were at Holly Shorts. Right here at the Chinese Theater a few, what's that, a few months ago now? My gosh. It was August, yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it's been so cool to see her work flourish and 
it just it's just incredible journey like inspiring person and oh my god so full of love i'm so happy to have her on oh <laughs> let's get into it hello 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 oh my goodness what a treat sophia we are so excited to have you on how are you good thank you so much for having me i'm really excited as well Yes. Thank you so much for being here. I feel like I only see you at film festivals, so I'm excited to now see you in podcast form. I know. <laughs> I met you guys how many years ago? Like two years ago? It was 2021 at Official Latino uh -huh. when they were celebrating in New York at the Cecil Hotel when Soy Un Vampiro got accepted as best comedy. You were wearing the same beautiful eyeball brooch that you're wearing now during this interview. How special, how amazing. <laughs> I, did it, I did it for you. I did it for you. This is for you. It's just a sign of appreciation oh. that I remember that day perfectly. <laughs> And also, Alejandro is the most detail-oriented person, so of course he sees these types of things, which I am so oblivious to. <laughs> well, Sophia, thank you so much for being here. Um, I guess our listeners are getting the gist of this, but Sophia is an incredible director, and after we met at Official Latino, Alejandro and Sophia stayed in touch, and then I reconnected with you at the Bentonville Film Festival, where you were winning an award. So please just give our listeners a little bit of feedback on what you've been doing, what you've been working on, how you first got into directing. Give us the scoop. I'm a writer and director from Monterrey, Mexico. I was born and raised there. It's like three hours away from Texas. But I've been living in Los Angeles for more than 10 years now. Um, I have dual, dual citizenship, so I, I believe that I'm like parts of the world. You know, I'm here, but I'm also in Mexico. I bounce back and forth doing projects, doing um, passion projects, but also uh, directing commercials and music videos, uh, short films, etc. I am a genre bending director, which means that I mix a bunch of genres starting from horror, comedy, magical realism, and anything in between. And yeah, I mean, I, I stayed in touch with Alejandro because we clicked instantly. And I think that he has always been an inspiration ever since I, I met him. And it's been a, a wild ride because after meeting him, that's kind of like the puzzle started revealing, like uh, <laughs> the costume Picadillo, which has you know, made a big impact in my career, I think, and my personal life. So I think it's, it's all great. <laughs> it's Tell beautiful. us about Pekka Dio. Yes. What do you want to know? <laughs> well, I guess tell us a little bit about, you know, the inspiration. You say that it made a big impact on your life and career. Tell us, tell us why. So this film, um, this short film, I wrote, wrote it about 20 years ago. So it was a while. Um, I wrote it inspired by personal stories, personal friendships that kind of like my friends that, that were having a hard time being themselves back in the day. Um, I know right now it's a little bit easier to, you know, be yourself and, and come out of that closet, just to say something like that. Um, and, but before it was just harder. And for Mexicans, especially that, you know, we're very religious and families are really religious and, you know, um, it's just harder for, for people, right? So I wrote this script and 20 years later, it was kind of like around the same time I met Alejandro, I met another girl called Rosa Venus. She's a musician and also the mother of a Vogue house. And meeting her just, you know, made me realize how incredible, you know, how open she was and how her family, like her chosen family were just very open and very themselves. I saw them and I was like, oh my God, I wish my friends were like that, you know, 20 years ago, <laughs> being themselves. So I decided to take the, the script out and just decided to shoot it, you know, with the community in, in Mexico. So this particular project has, has been a tremendous ride, you know, supporting the 
LGBT community in my hometown, in my country, um, has been very rewarding because not only we're like talking about accepting yourself and accepting others and just being yourself, but also um, giving opportunities to the LGBT community in front and behind the camera. So it's been a very important project in my life that has completely changed me. And I'm really proud that we got to do it now and not 20 years ago. <laughs> I don't think I would have been ready. Yeah. The timing of it is so magnificent. And that is something that I really admire is your ability to support communities by not only using words, but creating opportunities to do so for everyone to be involved and to see when, I mean, it was such an honor to be invited to, to support the project, but to be on set and to see how much love was really pushing everything forward and the, the amount of time that we spent together, it was truly, truly incredible and such a testament of your leadership and I mean, mastery of writing, really. And similar to Soy Un Vampiro, you know, I'm curious, what was what were some of the things that helped you discover your ability to genre blend as a writer? Mm -hmm. and, a and that's a good question. So I think that it's funny because, I mean, I started off my career directing music videos, you know, and as you know, music videos is like the pool of mm -hmm. where you want to explore your mind and do whatever you can wear a ton of hats and yeah well do everything for like little little money so starting my career there and then moving into commercials i remember when as soon as i started do, shooting commercials all the clients were like oh you're a comedy director and i'm like uh i don't think i consider myself a comedy director and then no she's a horror director i'm like okay and then everybody wanted to tag me for something you know like pigeonhole me or just like you know put a, a stamp like Sophia does horror she's a horror director Sophia does fantasy Sophia does comedy I'm like I'm sorry I do a lot of genres I bend genres I go from being funny to being very serious and I think it's also in my personality because I think I do take life seriously, but I also have humor and I feel like life is a roller coaster, you know, and, okay. and I feel like my work is a roller coaster as well. And I try, <clears throat> I try to do that with my work, you know, I don't want to just be a comedy director. I want to kind of have the viewer enjoy the ride with me and be very true to reality, which is there's full of um have ups and downs happy sad um glitter and blood <laughs> so yeah at columbia my favorite professor uh, jack lechner shout out jack where we're reporting live from um he always says that somewhere along your journey somebody will try to tell you to take the thing that's unique about you to stop doing it because people get used to being in one way and they're used to seeing content be in a typical way but there's something about you that's making you unique and to never lose that and i think for you it is how you so effortlessly blend genre and you take something that feels like it should be juxtaposed together, but you make it into something beautiful. Because you mentioned how you got your start in music videos and commercials, I'm curious how for you, you started trans transitioning into writing and directing, because I know a lot of our listeners are wondering, like, how can I be the next Sophia, right? They want to know, like, if I'm working in something that might feel like remedial, how do I transition that into making content that really fulfills you? Yeah, well, I think it's a great question. Um, <laughs> To be honest, I only wanted to be a music video director. That was my objective in life. I never wanted to do movies, but it was in a time where music videos were a big thing, you know, and I grew up watching music videos at home. And that was like kind of my window to the world because don't ask me why, but my <laughs> my house in mexico like from all, all my friends wanted to come to my house to after school to watch tv because i had usa tv and people didn't have that <laughs> i don't know how my dad got it but it was like our window our window to the world and 
that was a time, you know, I used to watch MTV, VH1 all the time. And, and the worlds just blew me away, blew mm. my mouth, mind out. So I wanted to do music videos for the rest of my life. And I try to follow the steps of uh, Michel Gondry, which is one of my favorite directors. I was like, oh, so he does music videos. And then he started doing commercials. So I'm like, I'm going to do commercials. And then I saw that he did films. I'm like, oh, my God, I can make films, too. So it was kind of like a self-discovery that I know that I've always been a good writer. I, I write since I was very young and I do tell stories, but I always thought that telling stories was going to just be through music videos. But then I realized that music videos, I wasn't going to make a living out of it. <laughs> so <laughs> I decided to do commercials and then, you know, I still do commercials and music videos once in a while. But, you know, right now my main focus is, is like doing, you know, films and bringing that same school of music videos into filmmaking. Because if you notice in my work, it goes in hand with music all the time. I'm very conscious of the music that I put. And most of the time, either the characters I write or the scenes that I write have a specific musical number somehow. Or have like those like visual explosions, candy, you know, I can be experience. <laughs> and I think that that's something that the music video world and commercial world taught me, to be honest. I, I think I went like this with your question. <laughs> no, it was great. But I think you do like that. This uh, And by this, I mean, for listeners who can't see it, uh, like a yeah. swiggling, squiggling sort of line. It's almost like you maneuvered that way when people trying to put you in boxes where you're like, oh, you write this, or oh, you do that, da, da, da. and it's like, it's almost like your immediate impulse was just like, no, well, I can do this too, and that too. And yeah, it's like, immediate impulse, even in answering questions, I always go like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect, but I love that. My brain is just like an explosion of things. It's like I see a word flying, and I want to say it, but... I don't say it and then it flies again. I'm like, okay, I'm going to say it, but that word is going to take you another direction. It's like a poop And that's flip. how you know you're a director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, being so attentive to so many possibilities of how to answer a question or how to execute a story, I mean, that has to be a driving force as far as how you've been able to get so much recognition across international and domestic festivals like Cannes, LA Shorts, Holly Shorts, Guanajuato International Film Festival, CineQuest. I mean, my goodness, the list goes on. So what can you tell us about the successful gains that you've experienced through these opportunities to showcase your work? Well, I mean, I think I've been very grateful and thankful for um, the process. You know, I think that before I jump into that that answer i'm just gonna say something you yeah. see a word a word flu. <laughs> i think that one thing that we should always consider is that this industry is very very difficult very hard and it's just like i feel like they that directors are put in a line to end up in a finish line and to be honest it shouldn't be a competition it should be mm. everybody should go through the, their own process. You know, I feel like yeah. my process has been slower in some things and quicker in others. You know, I mm -hmm. might have had a quick start in Mexico with music videos and this and that because, you know, when I started music videos in Mexico, there were not a, there were not a lot of female directors. I, I was one of the... the two directors that were chosen to do music videos for big bands mm -hmm. so there was my my quick start right right now i feel like i'm slower but i think that having these opportunities to be in festivals like Cannes, tribeca and um Sidges and things like that it's like a baby step that opens a a, a big door a big opportunity even if, like, yes, I, I made it to Tribeca, but not not uh, with a short film. I, I had, like, a micro short film 
under the section of Nespresso Talents, you know? Mm. But hey, Nespresso Talents, I submitted, you know, two short films in two separate years and I got in and I was one of the three USA chosen for Nespresso Talents, which is great because it gives you an opportunity to step up your game and go to Tribeca. Okay. And yeah. then, you know, with Can, you got, I had an opportunity to show my short over there. And it's just like a matter of taking those opportunities and embracing them. Right. You know, I think that, that I'm, I'm happy and proud of where I'm at, but I still want to keep going. <laughs> oh yeah. More were you, were you in the um, American pavilion at Cannes or where did you show your film? No. So in, in Cannes, it was in the short film corner. So that was my first <laughs> short film that I did was what, six years ago. My first short film was six years ago and I had a short film there and you could project that in, in one of the, not the pavilion, but a theater, but it was in the short film corner. Um, I can't believe I missed you because I saw you at Bentonville. Then I saw you again at Holly Shorts, but I missed you at Cannes. Oh, yeah. Well, Cannes, I didn't go this year. I went oh, okay. years ago. So that was like a while ago. I see. Okay. Which, yeah. you know, brings me to the question that I feel everyone is wondering. Where's the feature, Sophia? When will we be seeing the feature? <laughs> I'm like, I'm writing it now. No. <laughs> <laughs> We already have a feature written, but I think that that one it might not be my first one because it's like very complex and I feel like it might need a little bit more massaging and crafting to get there. But I feel like, yeah, I've been hyped up after Pecadillo, after all this. I'm like, oh my God, I need to shoot a feature now. Yeah. <laughs> so to answer that question, I hope pretty soon i'm in the works of you know just doing something <laughs> yeah what have been some challenges that you faced and how have you persevered through those challenges i think some of my challenges in general in this industry has been being latina mm -hmm. that's a challenge i mean mm -hmm. i'm just stating a fact yeah. Being Latina, being female, it just, I feel like any underrepresented community is going to have to work harder for a spot. And even that also adding to the picture that I'm not just a common director. I, I don't do, I don't just tell stories like from A to B, mm -hmm. you know, I go from A to a weird situation in the middle and to be you know like it's not a common way of storytelling and not every person not every film festival not every production company or studio might understand this but one thing in my advantage is that now it's kind of like they're turning their their eyes to see all these directors that have been genre bending for a while because now as you can tell, a bunch of series are incorporating this genre bending thing yeah. going on, right? Yeah. So, but it's been my challenge. I think that being um, sticking to my guns and being uh, Latina has been a challenge. But overcoming it means just keep going. At the end of the day, I think that the people who resonate with your work is gonna see it and take something out of it you know and yeah and i think that that's that's the way to go just keep going and with keep your unique style that you talk about like how did you get the confidence to take a risk and make the film yeah. which one picadillo well any of your films because i i do think that your style of filmmaking is you know, you don't follow the mold, you create your mold. And that takes a lot of courage. So I'm curious, like, how did you decide that you could do this? And how did you decide to make your own style? I mean, hmm, I think that I'm just, I just love taking risks. 
and I feel like I make the the work that I wish I could see, mm-hmm. or I tell the stories that I wish I could hear. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's so many movies out there that I would never be able to do because that's not my style, but they're beautiful. And sometimes I see a beautiful movie and I'm like, I wonder how I would have shot that, you know, that script. And I start thinking, and it's a totally different world that I painted. Mm -hmm. So I feel it's just, you know, taking the risk and doing what you feel is right and what makes you feel alive. And I feel like, you know, fantasy and surreal imagery and all that makes me feel alive. So I just want to, you know, put it in picture and story and share it with the world. I love it. And uh, it's such a beautiful example of really persevering through challenges is when you described wearing that which kind of makes us outsiders as badges of honor. I feel like those are really good ways to allow one's style to sparkle. But as you mentioned, you have a very glittering, well, as we know, you have a very glittering personality and storytelling style. But how else do you get your style to sparkle? How how do I get my style to sparkle? What, as a filmmaker, what? as an individual, <laughs> as, you know, just a person of this beautiful universe that we're living in. <laughs> Listening to music, meeting colorful people full of glitter and light, just like you guys, Um, having conversations with strangers. I just love that. You know, I feel like I'm one of those persons that I might be very social, but I can also be by myself and love Mm. it. You know, I, I can go to the park. Or, well, I haven't gone to the park in a while, but (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I can go to like a coffee shop or I can go to the beach and sit down and like people watch and just like get inspired by how people look at each other, how they touch the sand. You know, I just, those are the moments that for me are very inspiring or even conversations with friends or humans that I don't know. You know, I, I love that. Or even just petting a dog in the street from yeah. somebody else's dog, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like that inspire me. And listening to music, too. I love listening to music. What's some advice that you could share for first-time filmmakers who are maybe afraid to take that leap? I think my advice is, like, go for it. You know, if you feel like this is your passion, follow your gut do what you love don't see it as a race not because your friend is already in can or at the sundance you know whatever it's in one of the labs or or programs means that you you're not worthy for that you know i think that one of the things of of this um industry is that it teaches us that it's a competition and it's not yeah feel like we should stop seeing it as a competition and just craft your art tell your story keep going and then tomorrow you'll be realizing where your work can can go absolutely absolutely and i love that you know it's not a competition but one thing that i found really inspiring while being on set during picadillo was seeing similar to what you were describing as far as people watching seeing how you operated and how whether you were watching the monitor or how you were interacting with some of the main characters like it was so fascinating and so beautiful to experience you doing what you love with people that you love and i can't help but wonder you know you mentioned creating opportunities for uh, different community members to be able to uplift and celebrate But do you have any other tips for others who might be trying to make positive impacts on their respective communities, whether through storytelling or otherwise? Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, first and foremost, I think that if we want to, you know, help a community, like whatever community it is, 
right? I think that we should start by writing characters in like, for example, Latino characters mm-hmm. and Latina. And I want to see more Latino characters than from my, my job is to write characters that I can invite actual people that are Latino into uh, the project and also bring representation behind the camera and in front, you know? So I think it it goes all the way. I think that if we want to help our communities, we should start by writing stories about our communities, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that that's the way to go. I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't invite other people. Of course not. It just means that let's not forget about our roots, who you are, and what you want to do, you know? Absolutely. And are you directing work that you didn't write at this point? Or are you only directing work that you've written for narrative? So I'm only directing work that um, that I've written. I think that this next year I might be accepting other work written by somebody else maybe. But as of now, like when people look for me, they look for my um right you know what piece of a writing do i have my my scripts and things like that so but i'm a good collaborator so i can work (laughs) 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 something that the commercial world taught me how to work with other people collaborate you know with somebody else idea somebody else's idea and then you know spice it up (laughs) Do you have any resources that you would recommend for aspiring filmmakers to learn, grow, or experiment in storytelling? <laughs> I was just showing you. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, I love this. The first book that I had that I got from my dad when I when mm-hmm. my dad brought me to the U.S. to study film, he gave he bought me this book. Um, it's called Shot by Shot. Right? Shot by Shot. Yes. Even D Cats, and it has. So many, so much information that it's insane. I really recommend it because this taught me the basics of filmmaking, you know, like what you need, you know, uh, kind of an an understanding of uh, what type of shots they are, um, how to get an idea and put it on the screen. So this is, this is a book that I recommend. Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. I love that one, yes. a, A book that I recommend. What else? I mean, (laughs) to be honest, one of the things that I do is I try to watch at least, at least two films a week, at least. And I'm not talking about like films that are out in the theaters. You know, I think that it's important to watch films that actually made cinema, you know, like Mm -hmm. back in the day from directors, that maybe you have never heard of, you know, do your research and just like start digging deep of like the type of directors that existed years ago, but kind of like that resemble the type of work that you want to do. Um, Cause I think that that helps a lot to see how people, people with your similar mind were doing something, you know? I love so good. Me. Yes. Oh. oh, go ahead, Alejandro. No, it just reminds me of what you were saying earlier about standing on the shoulders of giants that stood before us, where when yes. you were inspired by the music video director and who eventually made a foray into commercials, like that's, I, I, I just love that. Uh, the I list. was just going to say that she transitioned us so well to ask her about her routine, sharing that she watches two movies a week. So thank you so much for taking our jobs from us, Sophia. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's a week at least. But, you know, as you are currently wearing a hat, and we know that you wear multiple hats in your day-to-day work life, how do you balance that? What are some healthy habits or maybe a routine that you stand by? Do you have one? What's the secret to being Sophia? Oh, healthy habits. I think that, I think that, that's a difficult question. But one thing that I want to, I do want to say is like, mental health is very important for me like because it um i think that this industry just consumes me sometimes especially 
after writing scripts and scripts and doing treatments and it's just my my brain gets really fogged up and i think mm. one of the healthy things that i do is like sometimes i might disconnect myself from uh social media for like three days without seeing it at least three at least three and yeah. then you know just kind of like stay away from too many people even if i love everybody i just want to you know take time for myself and just kind of take a deep breath and embrace the moment so i can get back on my feet and get back to <laughs> work <laughs> yes so kind of like med meditate i would say like meditation internal meditation <laughs> yeah we're huge fans of meditation here Huge fan. It's like, I need to meditate more. Yeah. But yeah, it's helpful. What is the wildest, funniest, most intriguing, or inspiring DM that you've ever received? Like a direct message? Yeah. Yes. Mm. M most like funny or like beautiful or what? It could be anything, like something that's memorable to you. Yeah. I mean, I think that lately I've been getting messages from strangers who watched Pecadillo. Mm -hmm. And that has brought me to tears in a good oh. way. Yeah. I get very emotional. I'm a very emotional person, which is good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, not too long ago, I just got a really beautiful message from somebody that watched the film. And just saying how all the, you know, all, I, I wasn't, I wasn't able to attend the festival, but I heard that everybody was like crying, but then laughing. <laughs> and then, so it was just very beautiful to hear that people were reacting to it. And for a stranger to take the time to write you a direct, to search for you and yeah. then write you a direct message for me, that's like, oh my God wow that's what i do when somebody like targets my heart and makes me feel something you know so i think that that i mean that those are the messages that i feel are very beautiful and mm -hmm. inspiring sophia what's your astrological sign aries aries okay <laughs> you're talking about emotion i was gonna guess cancer no i'm an aries that's a great one. I love that for you. <laughs> I'm a spacey person. No, just a fiery <laughs> spirit and a passionate soul. <laughs> Ooh, that should be her tagline. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Sophia. Well, our DM of the week asks, how do you envision your career blossoming in 10 years? How do I envision my career blossoming in 10 years? Let's see. I see myself surrounded by other filmmakers, new new generations, collaborating with new generations. And I also see myself making feature films that, you know, help people around the world and that make people feel alive. It's so beautiful. Yeah, I think that that's how I envision it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, thank you. Well, please take a moment to share with our listeners how we can stay updated on your work, how we can stay up on Espina Blanca productions, <laughs> um, everything, everything and anything that we can use to stay updated on your work, please. So, yeah, you can follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is Sophie Lala like my necklace, S-O-F-I-L-A-L-A, -L -A, like La La Land. You can follow me there. My Twitter is the same, Sophie Lala. And what else? My website is sofiagarsabarba.com. And you can find me there. Yeah, follow me, send me a message. I'm pretty good at replying. I'm a nice person. Mm -hmm. Unless you're not nice to me, then I will block you. 
And you're so positive. You show up. You show up as it's like to everything. I see you everywhere all the time, and you are just so supportive and kind. And uh, you are just a true gift to this universe and the gem, a sparkling gem of this beautiful thing we call life. You too, you too, Alejandro. I'm so no, happy. No, you more, you more. You more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're the best, and you too, Martin. I'm really happy that I got to meet you. Yes, you guys are always yeah. doing so much, and it's an honor to be here in your podcast. Thank you so much for being here. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. Our DMs are just like constantly at the edge of their seats, waiting for you. <laughs> waiting, waiting all the time. Oh my god, I don't know why I'm waiting, this. wishing, wanting. This happens, but my goodness, it's, it gives me a kick of joy. Just like how you give us kicks of joy when we know that you're listening, you're responding to our inquiries, you're sending us your own inquiries, sending us your reviews, your rates, your, well, not rates, but, you know, ratings. We want good ratings because this podcast. Because we want to keep bringing in more episodes. That's it. Well, I mean, bringing in more episodes, highlighting amazing voices and spectacular talent. So without further ado. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Damsels in the DMs. Until next time. It's going down in the DMs. Bye. DMs, DMs, we don't need them. We just leave them. Please. Yeah. It's going down in the DMs. Bye.